Day 250 of the Ukrainian War Map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian War. Juzzy here, and today is a much shorter and beginning of the week update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine today. And as always, I'll start off with the Russian military losses as of the 31st of the 10th, so October 2022, certainly a bit of a milestone day. 250 days in and when we start off we are dealing with an additional 620 Russian military personnel losses from the previous day. So currently sitting at 71,820. So certainly uh, above average for the day. And what also is above average is the hardware losses on the Russian side. So we have uh, for the armored combat vehicles an additional massive 32 losses for the Russian forces. Tanks 14, always a big number when we're talking about tanks. Four artillery, then one aircraft and one chopper, and I'll mention that one chopper there in a moment. So first of all, we'll move back to the map here. And in fact, outside of Ukraine, so in the Russian territory, so northwest of Moscow, you can't in fact see it on this map, but uh, really early reports are saying that in the Peskov region of Russia, two KA-52 alligator choppers were damaged by an explosion. Now, I suspect this was more like a homegrown explosion of sorts. Pretty much of Russia failing to maintain sufficient safety standards for their weapon systems. And I can't even count on all of my digits the amount of times this has happened now. And then back into Ukraine, so on the map generally, uh, air raids across the country have occurred as uh, Russia appears to recommence a barrage of new missile strikes in regions such as Kyiv, Odessa and Kharkiv. Now air defences are active in these regions, uh, taking out some or most of the missiles. And really, this is all part of Russia's well-documented strategy by now, to take out the power infrastructure, to make for a very cold winter, breaking the spirit and will of the Ukrainian people, to, to make them call for Zelensky's dismissal. But acts like these just make Ukrainians stand more united than ever. In other words, Russia can't win on the battlefield, so it tries this backup strategy instead. But I also think that Russia played its hand uh, in this regard way too soon, enabling Ukraine to start taking steps to circumvent loss of power in the middle of winter. And I rather instead think that the frontline Russian soldiers will end up being the freezing cold ones. And I'll give you a good example of this as well. So take this photo of this Ukrainian frontline dugout, uh, which is quite luxuriously resting looking there. Whereas undersupplied Russian forces on the front line will be in a cold trench and at best will receive a World War II cotton jacket from 1937. Not, not even kidding. Some of them are being supplied these. So we're going to see a lot of odd things on the Russian side in the middle of winter. Uh, so we'll, that is for certain. And really back to the map. So starting off in the capital of Kyiv today. So explosion sounds and smoke in the capital occurred as a result of some of these strikes. We're still waiting on the extent of uh, or a confirmation of the extent of damage there. It's probably good to mention at this point, Ukrainians are buying lots of household generators uh, at the moment there. But also many countries like the USA, Germany, and Spain are starting to send much larger generators as well to support a larger population. As it's all sort of a proactive measure of the, I guess to make it a protective effect against Russia's aggression on civilian energy infrastructure. And I'm throwing up a few photos in no particular order. We've got a German, Spain, uh, a Red Cross and a, a US aid uh, set of generators there. Then we'll move across to the Kharkiv Oblast, where a Russian attack helicopter was shot down in this region here. So the specific type is yet to be confirmed. Perhaps Russia was just testing <laughs> Ukraine's air defenses again, though it's a pretty expensive way to go about it. And when things like this happen, there is really so much wastage 
on the Russian side. Although I don't think Russia will technically run out of most weapons platforms. Instead, they'll continue to, to resupply Russian forces with older and older equipment. And I've got a funny example at the end of the video that I'll show you for that one too, if you stick around. And then back into the map in the Donbass region today. So just yesterday, I was able to all but confirm that the Svartove Krumina highway line. So we zoom in there and we'll be able to see it. So this yellow highway line on the right hand side here, that was under fire control by the Ukrainian armed forces. Now it's confirmed that it's under full fire control by the uh, Ukrainian forces there. Fire control being Ukrainian pinpoint artillery striking capabilities on the highway, on this highway in particular, making it somewhat of a suicide mission for Russian forces to attempt to even travel on the thing. Oh, and in this Luhansk region, we've got some very unusual, strange activity from the Russian forces at the moment. So within the last day that we know of, there's been no less than two instances of Russian forces blowing up bridges in an attempt to stop Ukrainian advances. Like this uh, first railway bridge north of Svartove, and this second bridge over the Krasna River nearby as well. So the question might be, does this look like a military force that is successfully invading and taking ground? No, exactly the opposite. So the Russian forces are actually making it harder for themselves to create an offensive at this location at a later date. Because we've learned some pretty interesting things in this war regarding Russian capabilities, not the least of which is that the Russian army almost is incapable of crossing rivers or tough terrains. Whereas conversely, Ukraine has all sorts of modern methods uh, to circumvent this type of issue. Also in this region, a Russian military base was hit in the Alchevsk region there of the, the Donbass, particularly that's uh, the Luhansk Oblast there. Then we'll move down a bit or more to the uh, west there of Bakhmut. So, just quickly, I'll bring in a mention for this one. So the Russian forces have appeared to switch gears here. Since their previous frontal attack attempts uh, really failed in the last week, they're trying a different approach now by coming from the south of Optine. So around here. And it has been repelled uh, again, and it's, it's a pretty obvious choice of a strategy for the Russian forces because it would theoretically give them the opportunity to start accessing the South Highway going into Bakhmut. So this highway here. Now, they want to do this because the Russian war machine just doesn't seem overly capable of taking an off-road approach in this war. Sometimes it's like they really rely on the pavement roads exclusively. Then we'll move a little bit further down, lastly in the Donbass today, so at the Vuladar settlement there. Got to zoom right out to find that one. Here we go, so Vuladar, Oop, here we go. So Russia started launching some attacks in this direction uh, into Vuladar. Now, topographically, the armed forces of Ukraine has the height advantage from here. It's hard to see on this map until you zoom in, sort of like a, a, a prolonged downwards sloping plane or set of planes there. And then moving over into the Zaporizhia Oblast, so in particular, Tokmak. So this has been back in the news recently in the last few weeks, some strikes here. So explosions occurred in Tokmak. Uh, not a lot of details on this one yet, but it's likely that it was from a high precision Ukrainian strike from the likes of an Excalibur shell or a high Mars missile, either a base, an airfield or an ammo dump. Speaking of ammo dumps, we'll move across to the Kherson region now where the Ukrainian forces disrupted two Russian ammunition depots. So in the Bashtanka and Berislav districts, and Berislav's right there, just on the north side of the Dnipro River. But also there was some strikes on the Antonivsky Bridge connecting both sides of the river here as well. To really cripple Russia's capability to resupply, 
or really to do a whole bunch of anything, to be frank. Oh, and also in this region, oddly, Russian forces are fortifying positions uh, to the west of the city, but below the river, so right around here. Trucks have been seen moving concrete bunkers to this location, and this footage was noticed by the locals there, which is pretty useless uh, when Kherson is liberated. But even before then, as it's impossible for Russia to stage an amphibious assault uh, from here as well, for example, and it's also quite odd setting up a fortified stationary position within range of so many Ukrainian systems, or rather weapon systems. Uh, from a look at the look at the distance here: nine point seven six kilometers, or about six miles. So, uh, almost any weapon systems, technically even a tank cannon, could could reach that distance. But you know, like many other examples in this war. Never stop your enemy when they're wasting time flogging a dead horse. I believe that's uh, that line is a, a typical anglophone expression, uh, but let me know if that one doesn't make any sense to you. And also, lastly, in this region of the Kherson uh, front line area, Ukraine scored a, a Russian T-80 tank. Really good to see. There's not many of them in this region, that's for sure. And a MP-2IM signals vehicle as well. Then we'll quickly move across to some news for today. So even after Russia recently stopped the safe passage uh, grain export deal from Ukraine as of yesterday, Ukraine, Turkey and the UN have still decided to ship grain, saying that they've just notified Russia that they're still doing it. Perhaps they'll stick to a, a, a or sorry, stick a neutral party flag on these ships. Otherwise, uh, they seem pretty confident Russia won't stop the passage of these grain ships. And in some more news, Russia is hoping to go back to the negotiating table now with the states. So Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that he's looking to go back to the table and negotiate, but has requested that Russia gets uh, uh, something of a security guarantee, uh, something that protects its security interests. And Russia also said that it wants to go back to the way the relationship uh, existed between Russia and the States in 2021. That's right, 2021. So just how things were before they started this senseless uh, war of aggression on Ukraine. So good luck with that, Russia. And in some other keen news... Italy and France will supply Ukraine with their SAMP-T air defense systems. These are considered quite effective and modern NATO air defense systems. So it's just getting closer and closer to closing the skies over Ukraine now. Which in fact again reminds me of my favorite Zelensky quote, which goes something like, uh, when Russia's ability to attack has been neutralized, they will only have the option to negotiate for peace. Just feels like really powerful stuff, that quote. And in another Russian mobilization blunder, I've got some footage here that I've had to turn into screen grabs because of some of the unsavory content for this platform. But basically, we've got some newly mobilized Russian soldiers who are inspecting their newly received weapons. They've basically received really old rusty rifles that are not working. And in this uh, video, the soldiers are saying that the weapons are not functioning, they're broken, like I said, or like they said, rusty. They're basically, in a way, like token weapons that the conscripts received, just so that it could be marked off on a page to say, yes, this soldier received a weapon. So that is to say, just physically putting something in their hands. And truly, no doubt, these old hunks of junk uh, were sourced from an old stockpile of a warehouse that had locks on it for, I'm guessing, 30 to 60 years. And in just a quick funny to round off the day, so in this footage, or again screen grabs just because of uh, certain unsavory content again, Ukrainian forces find an antique World War I a uh, Polymot Maxima machine gun relic at an abandoned Russian position on October the 30th, so just yesterday. 
So this is what happens, and I alluded to this at the start of the video. It's what happens when Russia expands all of its modern gear. And like I said earlier, technically they never run out of gear. So basically what they do instead is give their soldiers anything that they've got. It just gets older and older, the hardware, each and every time. So again, they open up the old stockpile warehouses and find these types of things, which I'm sure have more value at a pawn shop than they do on the battlefield. Okay, that's it for today, guys. Uh, slightly shorter video, as it always is at the start of the week. But uh, yeah, thanks again for all of your views, comments, and support. And I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.